first hybrid, hybrid training. Uh, we're here at the Bodega Grange in Bodega Bay, and we have folks joining us online. This is a little bit of a larger group, um, but I would love to get started with introductions of people's names and what brings them here today in like 20 seconds or less, if we can do that. Um, bear with us. And I would also like to start online if we can. Okay, Lily. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm really like, <laughs> this sounds silly. I really like whales. I think they're, uh, you know, I have never seen one up close, but they're uh, certainly very majestic. And I like being outside. So that's what um, brought me here today. I'd like to, you know, learn more about them and then share that experience with other people. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Lily. Yeah. Judith? You're muted. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've done the winter whale docent in Point Reyes for a couple of years, but it's a long drive. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm happy to, and I'm, I'm out at Bodega Head all the time. So uh, I'm happy to learn. And um, I actually was hoping at some point of maybe Point Reyes and Bodega Bay, people could uh, share resources, which I think is a good idea. There's a new person at um, Point Reyes who's never done the Winter Whale Watch. Can't remember he came from another park. So um, that would be great too. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Owen. I live in Carmichael, California, outside of Sacramento. And um, I'm a docent at Point Reyes for um, the Snowy Plover. And I love anything having to do with the ocean. So I'm looking forward to um, whale watching training. Love your Sand Hill Frame photo. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I'd rather not share my kept appearance this morning. Gail? My name is Gail Lee, and I'm a past docent from many years um, before COVID, um, and I'd like to get back into it. So I plan to start joining again. Thank you. We're excited. Morning, Gail. Amber? I'll be the human. Or Manny? Hi, this is Manny and Debbie. We uh, live out in um, um, Sereno del Mar, and we just thought it would be interesting to know how to spot those whales and maybe help some other people spot those whales. Awesome, we're excited to have you. And Norma? Hi, uh, this is Norma Jellison, and I am the uh, whale watch coordinator and with the help of a number of other people in the room who will introduce themselves. And I've been uh, associated with stewards doing various programs, uh, seal watch, whale watch, et cetera, et cetera, since before 1997. And um, I live in Sereno Del Mar and I'm um, looking forward to many new people to join us out there. It's a wonderful experience. Uh, to interact with all the folks who show up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Alice, and I'm the program manager at the stores of Coast and Redwood. So I joined uh, this uh, here, this position in March. So I'm very glad to assist the Whale Watch program. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. Okay. I'm Riel Stotson Newman, and I live in Petaluma. And so I just love whales because they're just a large mammal. <laughs> so I'm excited, and I was encouraged to come with my friends. So glad to have you. My name is Mina Newman, and I'm a volunteer at Stewart's Stu at the Redwoods. And I found out that that was a well watching training and decided, why not? Thanks for coming. Man. <laughs> oh my God. Hi, Freddie. I'm Karen. I'm 
than a bunch of different storage programs. Um, it's been, I think, probably a couple of years since I did the well wash training, and we've been seeing a lot of wells out there when I grow being at the coast and at the tide pools and, and, and monitoring. So I thought maybe it's also something to sort of refresh my well wash training. So nice to meet you all. Go ahead, yeah. I'm, I'm Richard, I'm one of the uh, coordinators on the weekends, and I've uh, been doing Whale Watch recently for a couple years now. Um, started in the 90s, but then had to take a, a leave, and happy to get back into it. Can you talk the sun behind you? Yeah. I'm Rich, uh, I'm also one of the coordinators. Uh, been coming over from Sacramento for the last uh, 30 years doing, uh, doing the Whale Watch on, on weekends. And uh, it's a great experience and, and it's nice having you know, new, new folks show up and uh, it, it's nice interacting with the people out on the head. That's, that's one of the most positive things. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, welcome. I'm Colleen, Rich's other half. And <laughs> yeah, as he says, we've been doing this a long time and we're so happy to see so many new faces and faces we haven't seen before. So uh, welcome and, and let's have fun together. Hi, I'm Lindsay Bolchel. Um, I'm the new American volunteer for stewards. So I came to this training because I like to get a good uh, feel for what the training is like, but also because I'm really excited to be a part of this event. I hope we're all just you know, to be a part of it. So I'm really excited. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name's Megan. I live in Bede Bay, and I'm and I hope to be a really fun way to use my free time. Thank you. Uh, my name's Nan, and I also live in Bay, and uh, just thought it would be a nice thing to do um, and maybe meet some more local people, like me and <laughs> My name is Tony. I'm in about 20 minutes east of here. Um, I've been to the day event many times and I love it. I love nature and learning about nature and trying to do anything I can to improve the relationship between humans and nature. So thank you. Hi, my name is Melinda. I live in the neighborhood too, but I live right down the street. I was um, a supporter of the whale docents, if not out on the head um, for the past, I don't know, five years, I think. <laughs> so in more, 2015, I think I started. I also work here in town. I work at the Tide, and I would like to support um, whale, uh, the social media aspect of this. If we do whale reports, I can put them out on the web. So um, the Tide is happy to do that and happy to support you all. Yes, we've done that in the past, and then we stopped with COVID. Yeah, so happy to do that. Uh, I'm Diane Gary, and I live out here also. And I've done whale watch for many years, formally, and then when we had relatives in the middle of the country, kind of had to give them a take between the middle of the country. But I'm back uh, being able to do it, and I have the same interest as many of you do. But being around these animals, and also the fact that they are. Hi, I'm Lena, and I like nature a lot. The other guys, I'm currently volunteer for the California State Parks, and I'm just looking for another opportunity to be volunteer. I'm Amanda. Um, I live over in Austin. And I've only been here a year. I, I love living here. I love the ocean. I just want to give back. Good morning. My name is Beth Mara, and I'm a relatively new volunteer with uh, the state park system and the stewards. Um, I love the coast. 
love the Redwoods and um, I enjoy spending lots of time both places. And uh, this is my first well watched uh, I'm Larry, and uh, last winter was my first year on Whale Watch, and it was a great experience. Um, those of you that are new, there's a great group of veteran whale watchers that you just uh, soak up knowledge from. And it was uh, a great experience to meet people from all over the country and uh, be able to help them share the experience that I was. I'm John Hershey, I'm a local photographer and artist, and I, um, I've experienced the whale watch people out of the and really. Uh, I'm Michelle, and um, that's how I got here. I went to Jeff Jones Media. for almost 32 years, and I am getting into Williams for more than a few years. I'm taking classes in and I'm interested in that. Uh, yeah, welcome. Hi, I'm Katie from Green Stillmar, and the Green is why I'm here. I love Green. Oh, and so that's what I'm doing. I'm Julie Ann Hill, and I was the executive director for the Stomach Coast Visitor Center for 14 years. So I was the person who sent people up to you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, my husband recently passed away in January, so now I have a little bit of free time in between. Several food banks. Thank you. Oh, and everybody can pass it my house on the way to the end. Oh, okay. Thanks for that, Yabra. My name is Ann, and I live on the mountain up in my mountain. Much longer than this. But um, I spent many years living in the coast. Down here. Yeah. I'm Jeff. <laughs> a lot more than whales. Out of the <laughs> and I'm here to tell you how I can. So excited to learn from you. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for the introductions. Really excited to, uh, to meet you all. Um, thank you for coming together. Whale Watch is our second oldest program. That's through to the coast of Redwood. We are a small grassroots, uh, volunteer driven nonprofit organization. It's the volunteers like you uh, that help make our programs work and help make our partnership with California State Park work. We have a lot to talk about today. Um, so I'd be glad to hand it off to Alex to give an overview of the Volunteers in Parks program. Yeah. So uh, just like. Uh, Okay, so just like Justin said, that uh, so Stores of Coast and Redwood is a nonprofit organization. So it's also a cooperating association for California state parks. So we are one of the 89 networks of the associated cooperating association. So we help and assist California state parks to recruit and manage volunteers. So just like if you guys work at the Bodega Head, and so it's one part of the Sonoma Coast State Park. So we are here to help you guys to know how to become a volunteer at the state parks. That's it. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and next we're gonna talk about marine, okay. marine protected areas uh, to give sort of a, a broad context and overview. Um, of where whale watch fits into that, and also highlight the importance of natural resource protection. Yes. You got to put it on stamp. Okay. Yeah, I'll share my screen. Okay. 
Can folks online see this? Yes. Well, oh, thank you. All right. Cool. So, California uh, Marine Protected System um, is really leading uh, worldwide and um, across the country. Uh, marine protected areas are similar to uh, a designation. Like you can have a state park or a national park, there's different levels of protection. Uh, we received uh, national marine sanctuaries in the 80s. In the early 90s, California passed the Marine Life Protection Act, which created this whole network and system of wonderful marine protected areas up and down the coast of California. And that was uh, went into action in 2012, and it was a collaboration between government agencies and grassroots groups like stewards and individuals like yourselves. So there's lots of slides that we can't uh, really read anything on, but um, just wanted to point out, uh, here is where we're at in Bodega Bay. Uh, it is within the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary, and beyond that lies Cordell Bank, which is a really unique place, um, only accessible by boat. If you ever get a chance to explore it, it's like the Great Barrier Reef of Southern California. So what do marine protected areas protect? A variety of habitats from the inner tidal to the estuary uh, to many different marine mammals. And uh, an exemplary of this is the big, old, fat, fertile female fish, otherwise known as the bob. <laughs> so I'm a single 35-year-old uh, man and um, counterparts in my age. It's, you know, fertility for humans kind of maxes out in the middle and uh, wanes off in age. For fish, it's completely different. Um, they become more fertile as they get older. Uh, on the left, you have a more juvenile um, fish that produces 150,000 uh, young each year. And on the right, you have a two-foot fish that produces up 1.7 million young each year. So the marine protected areas are specifically uh, created uh, to protect species like this so that we can support the vitality of the underwater ecosystem as well as fisheries. So that's not cumulative, that's annually? Yes. Wow, that's yeah. helpful. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, I mean, holy smokes, they just kind of... So there are different uh, levels of protection uh, based on the marine protected area designation. Uh, you have state marine reserves, state marine conservation areas, uh, as well as others. Uh, at Bodega Head, we actually have two designations. We have the State Marine Reserve, which basically means you can't touch anything, you, there's no tape. Um, and we also have, I think it's State Marine Conservation Act, but we'll take a look at that in just a second. There's four different ones, two in the Russian River. <coughs> We are only seeing the first slide on Zoom. We are we have not seen another slide. It's not advancing. No, not for no, me. No, we just see the first the first title slide. Stop sharing. That's better. Yeah. We see maps. The camera does the camera need switching? No. no. Can you see it now? Nope, nothing now. Oh, now there we go. We see a map okay. slide. Yeah. yeah. It looks like we missed a few. You might want to okay. back oh, yeah. it up and show yeah. us what you had before. Um, yes. We couldn't see so any juveniles or big ones or left or right or any of yeah. that. Do you see the, the bop? Yeah, cool. Okay. And then I think we might lose it if we um, go into presentation mode. So we're just going to keep it in PowerPoint mode. Um, 
Oh, whoops, can you see well enough? So, these are the marine protected areas that we have uh, both in the Russian River and at Bodega Head. Uh, Russian River has a state marine conservation area as well as a, a SMIRMA. A SMIRMA is a state marine recreational management area. It means that uh, there's hunting allowed there. Um, and then at Bodega Head, you have a state marine reserve to the north and a state marine conservation area to the south. And the differences are about take. So there's no take allowed in the state marine reserve. And if you see the line that goes pretty much directly west uh, from the head, it's known to, to fishermen as like the wall that you're not really supposed to go past. Uh, the Fisheries Department of Fish and Wildlife does do enforcement and there are often um, incidences where they'll need to do some education with fishermen as well as do some citation within the marine protected area. This is just a, a list of different um, marine protected areas nearby in the Sonoma Coast. Each has its own suite of rules and regulations. And really the important thing to know for what they get is uh, no take within the marine reserve uh, that is to the west and the north directly above. And it helps protect the whales. And it's a whale feeding ground as well, which is the marine protected area. So the formation of the marine protected area um, is supported by a group called the Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network. Oh. And it's a nonprofit that supports local organizations. Um, you see on the right, this is in uh, 2012 when they um, really launched the marine protected areas that there was a statewide leadership team of agencies um, in coordination with community collaboratives doing work for outreach and education on the ground. Um, this is important work that Stewart is a part of, along with the Bodega Marine Reserve. Um, together, we're the chairs of the Sonoma Marine Protected Area Collaborative. Uh, the members are local nonprofits, local agencies, individuals, uh, tribal groups. If people have more interest in getting involved with the Marine Protected Area Collaborative, I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, and then I just wanted to give some highlights of the Sonoma Coast. There's also over 4 million visitors. Uh, it's a very highly visited state park, which is why it's important to have interaction with the public. There's a commercial fishing fleet, there's tribes, there's a marine sanctuary, there's lots of history and agriculture and all these things intersect at the places that we're talking about today. And the Sonoma Marine Protected Area Collaborative, there's a lot of discrete projects. There's a new project over here. Um, there's a number of videos online that you can see at mpacollaborative.org slash Sonoma about why Sonoma County needs marine protected area collaborators. Or marine protected areas, there are uh, videos about the tribal uses of the marine protected areas. Um, our project for this year was installing two roadside signs, like the one depicted in the lower right to increase awareness around the marine protected areas. We had one on the beach going out to Goat Rock. We had one on the road out to Bodega Head at Alt Canyon, right before Campbell Cove. Um, it was complemented with on the ground surveys that folks from uh, Beach Watch did. And it showed that it did increase awareness around the MPAs, which is really great. Uh, for this year, we're doing a project with the Kashaya tribe on uh, tribal names for coastal features. So, Lots going on in the marine protected areas and um, an important intersection for whale watch. Yep, and that's, that's it. So I will go ahead and pass it on to Norma and get her set up unless anybody has questions about our marine protected area. So there's um, there's more up there. So there's one for Gersel Cove specifically. So if you go out to Gersel Cove, it's 
on each side of the code marine protected areas within it. Um, you can go on uh, the website. There's a website that has all the different boundaries, and they're they're all really site specific and scientifically based. Um, but for Bodega Head, it just goes to about the north end of the bay. Any questions from folks online? So will they be putting or the um oh no, will they be putting or the what is it? Yeah. Okay. Kishai, Kishai, okay. Yeah. Will they be putting signs up to identify? The it's area? gonna be a, an online video oh. and it's uh to help share tradition and culture through the tribal language. And if you read um the Kashaya name. For a lot of things, it's really hard to be able to pronounce it. So we're putting it in an online video format that will have a native speaker saying words, as well as the pronunciation and spelling. Um, okay, but not help. at the site. Not, like not at the site itself. It's going to be integrated into programs like Whale Watch, uh, like our Typhus program, like our Sea Watch program, um, and available for folks to learn more about as a resource. Good, good question. Okay. All right. Well, I'll hand it off to Noah. Thank you. Hey, thank you for being here, everyone. And I'm going to just sit up here and talk, uh, talk through the slides. And uh, hopefully, I'll give you a nod and you can advance it for me. So you can go ahead to the next slide. So, what we interpret as the day ahead is the Eastern Pacific gray whale. And um, we think we're on the West Coast, and we are, but we're uh, on the East coast of the Pacific Ocean. And these uh, whales are Eastern Pacific gray whales. And they're uh, they're the larger, there's only one, there, there's a Western population that is very small, about 300 whales. And that's over off the coast of Japan and uh, Russia and uh, Korea. And then the, uh, there, there used to be an Atlantic ocean population of gray whales, but they were hunted to extinction. So this is pretty much it, the Eastern Pacific gray whale. And we're lucky that we can see it because we, you don't have to get in a boat. You can see it from, see the whales from land. And they're, of course, they're, they're mammals and they're cetaceans along with dolphins and porpoises. And they're baleen whales. So there are a number of baleen whales and somebody mentioned seeing a lot of whales lately that would have been humpbacks, and they're also baleen whales. And as I said, they're visible from shore. They're a coastal whale. They, they use two uh, currents to migrate south and north, and so that makes it really convenient for us to be able to stand on the, on the coast and interpret to the, to the people, the visitors who come. These whales, they migrate along the entire North American coast between the Arctic, uh, three, three places in the Arctic, the Bering, the Beaufort, and the Chukchi Sea. And then they go down to lagoons in Baja, California, in Mexico. And uh, that migration is one of the longest migrations of any mammal. Go for the next slide. So how do we know we're seeing a gray whale? Well, because it's, uh, it's, it's very distinctive from other whales. It has a fairly streamlined body. 
a narrow tapered head. Uh, it's, it's gray mottled, which is a function of uh, barnacles, which fall off and, and leave scars. And uh, there's no dorsal fin, uh, no top fin on this whale. Uh, it has uh, small paddle shaped flippers and its fluke is uh, pointed. It has a deep center notch, which you can see on this uh, tail, which is diving um, in Baja. Actually, there's some sand dunes behind it from Baja. And, um, you know, I mentioned that there, this, uh, the Eastern Pacific, North Pacific gray whale population, we've actually seen in the last few years um, about 50 some of that population, uh, 50 some whales from that population who have swum all the way across the Pacific Ocean and shown up in the lagoons in Baja. And um, that's pretty, pretty phenomenal, pretty phenomenal. Let's go to the next slide. Can, can people online hear okay? Yes. Thank you. Hey, right. Norma. Do they, Norma? Yes. Do they know why they come over? Because they can? Yeah. <laughs> I understand that's our standard response, but nobody really knows why right now. No. Okay. When you say across, what do you mean? Okay. Well, they're coming from off the coast of. Kamchatka in Russia and uh, and Japan, Shakhalin uh, uh, Island off of Russia, South Korea. So, like as I said, there's there's fewer than 300 whales there, and about uh, so what? Who's documenting this? Is in uh, the Laguna de San Ignacio in Baja, which is one of the three mating and calving lagoons. There's a research program there called the Laguna San Ignacio Ecosystem Science Program, and it's a very it's a great site to go to. They they put out research reports uh, all the time. They monitor the gray whales. They monitor the birds. They're they're starting to do what uh, is much more uh, available and has been for a long time. Is the humpback whale. But this has been a manual for the gray whales. They started to do a lot of that kind of on the, uh, down in, in the Laguna. Um, audio's coming in and out now online. Sorry. Something changed. <laughs> Move our fancy. Yeah. Camera stand. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. So sizes. This is uh, obviously it's not the largest whale. You probably all already know that the largest whale is the blue whale. Mm -hmm. And then the next largest whale is the fin whale. And the, the grays uh, are only 45 uh, feet 40 to 45 to 46 feet for the males and then the females are larger because of course they have to carry the calf and uh when the calf is born it's it's 12 to 15 feet so it's not a little tiny thing <laughs> and it weighs 1200 uh 1500 to 2000 pounds at birth and then the adults they can weigh up to 45 tons and this, this um, I have here, the population is approximately 20,000. And wa I want to stop a minute and talk about this number because it's rather uh, interesting. And it, it is what we believe is currently the number. But we are in the fourth year of an unusual mortality event, a UME which uh, started uh, and was first noticed, by the way, in the lagoons in Baja when whales started showing up, emaciated, uh, skinny whales started showing up in the lagoons, which indicates that they weren't getting enough food. 
And this, uh, then we began to see uh, whales dying and washing up on shore. And I'm sure that you've seen many uh, stories in the local papers about, about this UME. And in fact, uh, there was a very good article in the LA Times fairly recently uh, in October of this year about the gray whales continuing to wash up dead and emaciated. Uh, there was an article, a CNN article, a National Geographic article in 2021, 2021, and uh, Bay Nature, a local magazine in the East Bay did an article about the grays. And then of course, uh, the Laguna San Ignacio Ecosystem Science Program has been putting out information about what they're seeing down there, which is which is smaller numbers of showing up and fewer babies, fewer calves being born. And uh, why is this happening? Well, there are numbers. If the jury is still fully out, but the bottom line is conditions are changing in the Arctic, uh, which because they are predominantly have been in the past bottom feeders, if their prey is not available, then they can't get enough food to bulk up, which is what they subsist on during their migration from uh, Alaska to Baja and back. So uh, we're just, we're seeing that warming oceans are really having an effect on their preferred prey. And at one point, we had another UME about uh, in, in 1999, 2000, I believe it was. And it decimated the population at that point. And then they, they returned in numbers and went back up, went up to about 27,000. And now in the last, uh, in this UME, We've, we've found 500, at least 500 carcasses along the, the, the coast, the Pacific coast. And of course, many that we don't see because they sink. Um, but so the, the, the population back down to a, a smaller number again. And um, they're, they really, uh, we don't, some, some speculation is that maybe they reach their carrying capacity. However, if you go to Scammon's, if you, if you can get a, a copy of Scammon's book, he was a whaler who became a biologist. Uh, he wrote a, 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 an incredible book. And he talks about how many whales there were when they were, uh, when they were hunting. Uh, it, it far exceeds 27,000. So, uh, you know, it, whether that carrying capacity is happening, we really don't know. Uh, and you probably also have read local San Francisco Chronicle and other articles about the gray whale showing up in the San Francisco Bay, which is fairly unusual. It isn't that they never have, but they're showing up more often there and they're attempting to feed. And that is, uh, that is unusual. There isn't a lot for them to eat in the bay, but what we also are seeing about these gray whales is that they're transitioning more. We used to say they're opportunistic feeders. They mostly feed in the bottom sediment, amphipods uh, in the bottom sediment in the Barry Beaufort and Chucky Sea, but we're starting to see them more and more being pelagic. So uh, that means that they're going after food in the water column, uh, krill to some extent, but not, not fish really because uh, they have a very small throat opening. So let's go to the next slide and see where we are. So these whales, um, they, only, they only live, uh, uh, well, they, they actually, I'm sorry, they're only re they only reach sexual maturity uh, in, in five to 11 years or when they're about 36 to 39 feet. And the, the female will carry the calf uh, 12 to 13 months. So 
So that's a, a long time that she has to sustain the calf essentially without eating. And when uh, she's, she nurses uh, seven to eight months, she's, just, her, she's giving 50, to 50 gallons of milk a day. And it's very, very rich. It's a high fat content. Uh, you can see on the slide, 53% fat versus our milk. And uh, so it takes a lot for a female gray whale to sustain her calf during the migration and then after it's born in the lagoons, nursing it until it's, uh, it, can, it can begin to take the journey with the mother north. And of course, because the calf is so large and it's carried for so many months, she's only having a calf every couple of years. Do you guys understand what she said? The newcomers understand what she meant by that? The mother stops eating in Alaska and doesn't eat again until she gets back to Alaska. She loses 40% of the body weight on that trip. Yeah, that's about a year. Yeah, pretty close. 12,000 miles. They, yeah, they, they leave, they leave Alaska at ice up, you know, when, when the oceans up there begin to ice up and they can't get at their, their amphipods that they, that are their preferred, preferred food. And of course, with, with the changing conditions, it's hard to tell how that will affect them. We've seen some of the, uh, some increases in calves being born on the southbound migration, particularly off of LA and San Diego area before they get to the bursting lagoons, which may have uh, maybe influenced by the fact that they leave later. And she, she's trying to eat more so she can sustain herself and the calf during the migration uh, getting down to the birthing lagoons in Baja. Okay. Can I ask you see the next slide here? Mina has a question. Okay. Where Who are the birthing lagoons in Baja? They're in, they're in, they're on here. Here, this, this question. <laughs> okay. They're, on, they're <laughs> on the west side of Baja from about midway down where it turns to Baja Sur. Okay. And uh, the, the main ones are Ojo de Liebre, which is also referred to as Scammon's Lagoon, referring back again to that wonderful whaler, Scammon, who decimated the whales, but then became a biologist. And Laguna de San Ignacio, uh, which is one that many uh, people go to because it has what's called the friendly whales, which people, go out on little pongos with ecotourism groups there and the whales swim up to the boat and you can touch the whale. The mother pushes the baby up so you can touch the baby. Pretty amazing for uh, an animal to do that who's been hunted almost to extinction uh, to have that kind of faith in humankind to say, here, I want you to see my baby. And uh, there's, there's a great book over there that Diane <coughs> shared with us, uh, her, her photos from being down in the lagoons, right? Diane, you've got some great pictures of, of some of the calves. So like I said, they mostly are being born. And yeah, that's, a, that's one coming out of the water. It's a great picture. Uh, they mostly are born in these lagoons, but some are born in the Southern California waters. But even if they are, the mother will take the calf and take it down to the lagoons and, and nourish it and, and nurse it there until it reaches the size and the strength. It has the strength to be able to make the northbound migration with her back to Alaska. So as I said, they feed mostly in Alaska in these three seeds, um, about five months worth of uh, feeding up there until the ice forms. And then uh, there is, there, they have this opportunistic feeding capacity where they, if they come upon krill, a krill, krill wound, they will certainly open <coughs> their mouth and swallow. 
But what we're starting to see is that they're transitioning to being mostly, mostly feeding benthic, the amphipods in the bottom sediment, to more and more pelagic feeding in the ocean column because of the lack of supply of the amphipods and because of the rising ocean temperatures in Alaska. So there's a, there are a number of places along the coast where gray whales summer over. One is in Depot Bay in Oregon, and you can go there and there's a, there's a program that's operated by a woman uh, who's a professor inland, uh, Carrie Newell. And <coughs> she has been, uh, she takes people out on boats but she's been photogra a photographer and she's been chronicling the summer resident gray whales for a number of years. And she, she has a book that she put out with a lot of pictures of the whales that come there summer after summer to see. And then the other thing that we're seeing, we started to see is a group that uh, is spending a lot of time around Puget Sound in the summer. Uh, summering over, and some of them don't make the migration past that. They're called sounders, because you know they're in they're in that area, and uh, they're showing up earlier in, in Puget Sound than in the past. And again, we think that's because they're hoping to find more food that they weren't able to uh, get uh, access to in the lab. So who, there's a lot of research that's done on the sounders by uh, John Kalamokadis, who is with Cascade Research in Washington. And I've heard some really great presentations that he's done uh, with the, um, and, and that uh, he's done a lot of research. So that's a, a possibility for you to look more into what's happening with, these, with the sounders and the places along the coast where the whales are showing up more and more. So is this, yeah, the migration? I have a quick question. I'm sorry? I have a quick question. Uh -huh. um, so do the males go to the lagoons? Yes. So, yes. so is there food in the lagoons? Not really. Okay. Not really. Um, is there food in like Depot Bay or any of those places? Or? Yeah, in Depot Bay, there are uh, there are shrimp that live in the kelp beds there that they can feed on, and and they do. Yeah. Uh, so the, the oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. So this past July and into the beginning of August, we were seeing a ton of whales migrating north, mothers and calves, and we were reading different things about whether this had to do with maybe the gray whales for these purposes migrating later because they have enough or something, or whether we were seeing other whales. Yeah. And so I wondered if you had any insights on that. I, we I never got yeah. a clear answer. Yeah. I, I doubt that you were seeing gray whales in July. Um, for the most part, they would have passed us and been further north on their migration path to Alaska. Um, yeah. But it's not impossible. It's not impossible, but it's unlikely. Yeah, and yeah. so what other whales would have been mothers and cows? And I'm actually not talking with a day, I'm talking about like 12 points. That's not that, yeah. that much further. Well, that, you know, that might have been the tail end. You might, you might have seen the, the tail end in into June. But pretty much, I mean, yeah. the reason that we stop whale watch at the end of May is because they're, they're pretty much gone north. They've gone by us. And... Um, Another place that is a good place to see whales and actually is better than Bodega Bay, but uh, is Point Arena Lighthouse because it sticks out so many miles further into the ocean than we do. 
they see a lot more whales uh, and different kinds of whales than we do. But we haven't, um, they haven't seen gray whales in July and August either. So if you were seeing whales, you probably were seeing, you probably were seeing humpbacks. What? Humpbacks. Well, yeah. yeah. There's we, a we, population that goes from Northern California, Oregon, all the way down to Costa Rica. Right. And that's, uh, it's not as large as the humpback population that goes between Hawaii and Alaska. Right. But it's maybe, you know, a third of that. It's, it's still a good size, uh, yeah. size population. And, and the majority of the humpbacks, uh, I mean, the humpbacks are why our crab season has been delayed for the last two years because they have been actively feeding off of the coast here and uh, becoming entangled. And uh, so the state regulators have, have said, well, there won't, we can't begin to do crabbing. Commercial uh, has been delayed for like the last two years. Now you'll see a lot of boats out there today probably, but they're recreational crabbers. They're not commercial. The commercial season has not been opened yet for crabbing. Yeah. Norma, yes. have a question. Somebody has a question yeah. online. Yeah. Okay. Judy's, if you want to. Uh, um, yeah. Norma, I I heard from a couple of people who are usually at the head that there were four or five grays that they thought were hanging around year round. Yeah. Well, I don't know about four or five. But I, 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 I don't think so. There was one or there were one or two uh, that were still there when we ended the season in May, and I, I heard, uh, you know, that that maybe it, they left, they stayed around a little bit longer. There have been times in the past, uh, but it hasn't been for more than I would say. 10 to 15 years ago, where we had about a dozen juveniles that hung around a lot during the summer, but they never stayed the entire time. They, they, they continued on with their migration. Um, so it, it can happen that they'll, they'll linger, but they're, they're not around in sufficient numbers to continue the whale watch program. So back to the migration, which is fairly a fairly long migration, one of the longest of any of the whales. And uh, it, at, they, it averages 12,000, but it can be longer. Because it depends upon where they start. If they start in the Beaufort or the Bering or the Tuck TC, and whether they're going to Ojo de Liebre, whether they're going to San Ignacio or whether they're going to Magdalena. So that's the variation in the round trip mileage. And as I said, the southbound, they will leave Alaska generally at ice up in October. And then uh, they'll continue. They, they are seen in the southbound migration uh, out on the horizon because they're using the California current, which is one of the most productive currents in the world. And it's out at the horizon. It helps them to uh, swim. And so they're, uh, they're leaving up there. They're coming reliably past us at Bodega Head in December, but for sure in January, and then it would pick up January until we start to see the turnaround. They're down in the lagoons uh, from roughly December to April, and then they head north. And uh, when the whales, when the when the calves are large are large enough and strong enough, the mother will take the calf north. <laughs> but the adults begin to come past us in about mid uh, to late uh, February, and that would be the immature males, the females, and but the first ones we will see will be the newly pregnant females. 
the ones that got pregnant in the lagoons are on the way down to the lagoons and now they're headed north to feed. And as I said, the last to go by us um, in mostly in April and uh, May and they're closest to shore. Uh, they're using a different, a different current to go north than the southbound one. And they uh, are right, right off the head in the water, right in front of us. It's just really wonderful to be able to see them. And often what we'll see is that the mother and the calf will come around Point Reyes, the tip of Point Reyes, and then they'll come at us at an angle. Then they stop the feed over by the jetty and then they'll come around past us right in front of us at the overlook. And uh, they stop because she's still nursing. The mother nurses the calf the whole way north, which is another reason why it's, a, it's such a strain on the mother, the female, because she's pretty much not eating and she's feeding the calf 50 gallons of milk a day while they're swimming. Now, they may be slow swimmers, three to five miles an hour, pretty slow. It's kind of why they have so many um, barnacles on them. The barnacles don't get knocked off by the velocity of the swimming, like with the humpback and some of the other whales that have barnacles. But um, yeah, they're still, they're still making their way and she's still nursing the calf. So it's, calf needs to rest, it's a baby. And um, she's also, trying to protect her calf from predation by the only predator is um, our wonderful orcas, which everybody loves orcas. They're not whales, they're dolphins, but they're called killer whales because they are killers. Um, this, this shows the migration path. You can see uh, where they're going from all the way up in Alaska to down in Baja. See what the next slide is. I think it's um, yeah. repeating kind of what I said about the slowness of their speed Look at the spout. and their breathing pattern. Yeah, see the spout is heart kind of heart, heart shaped one on the right or straight up col column like. Okay, so that, a lot bigger. that helps that helps to identify what you're seeing when you when you're looking uh, at the blow depending upon the size I mean if out at the horizon I mean way out at the horizon you might on occasion sometimes a little bit closer in see a blue but I'll tell you if you saw a blue blow you'd know because it'd be like tall like a little bit. Where, where these these are not as uh, robust in, in height as that is, but they um, they'll they'll breathe, their breathing pattern is that they'll blow you know a handful of times three to five uh, short intervals and then generally they'll take a dive at that point and they'll be uh, submerged for about two to five minutes and then but they can stay under. For 15 minutes, they can hold their breath. And sometimes what we'll see is uh, we'll see all this blow activity. We'll see back. We'll see the, the tail when it dies. And then it doesn't come back up. <laughs> and we have we have a little a thing we say up there. Oh, it went into the tunnel. <laughs> and it, it'll get shot up, uh, shot out up by Dennis. <laughs> But um, yeah, but but definitely the the telltale is the shape of the blow and the uh, number of the and number and intervals of the breath that it takes. There's the snorkeling, Norma. Yeah. Yeah, what we've observed, like down in the lagoons, you'll see a, a whale down underneath the water. And as it starts to come up, it exhales underwater. So by the time it gets to the surface, there's no more exhalation. There's no blow to identify them. And when they come up, then they can just take a breath and go back down. 
And so when we stop seeing them out there, that's one of the things we suspect is happening. They're exhaling underwater like a swimmer. They come to the top. All they do then is inhale and go back down. And it makes it very difficult to see them unless you're looking right at the right spot to see the shiny back or whatever. Yeah. That's kind of, we talk, they're in stealth mode then, what we say. <laughs> and uh, let's, let's see what the next slide will show us. So their diet, again, uh, circling back to mostly they eat amphipods and that's, um, you can see how small they are. And they're mostly, they're eating about a ton a day, if you can believe that. And they're up there in Alaska when it's 24 hours of light and there's no ice. So about, there's, what is felt is that they're eating about 67 tons a day during the five months that they're up there on the feeding ground. And what, why, why are they doing that? Well, because they have to bulk up and, and have all this blubber to sustain them on the migration south and then back up. And then of course, the mother is nursing on top of that. Yes. Question about the baleen. So uh -huh. the baleen, the hair-like things that are around their mouth, that's good for finding amplified because they sift that sand. Yeah, grab, grab the baleen on the table and hold it up if you would. Um, oh well, the seat is good. Well, bring it over here so that it's by the camera. By the camera. In front of I just it. do the. In front of it. Yeah. So this is the baleen. It's like a comb on the back, right? This is the front side, right? This is this hair like thing. Yeah, there you go. And then that's on the back. So, yeah, so what they do is what they do is they, they go down to the bottom, they take in a mouthful of mud and water, and then they push with their tongue against the baleen. And the water goes through the plate. And the hairy part touches the amphipods and then they lick it off. So they're making, you know, their head is about seven feet long. So when you're, if you see aerial pictures of feeding, the feeding ground, you'll see these huge holes in the sediment up there. And they're about seven feet. And, and mostly they're right sided. So what you'll see is when they wash up, the barnacles are gone from the right side of their head. So my question is, so this new type of feeding in the in the water column, yeah. called pelagic feeding, uh -huh. are they using their baleen or is not it going right in their mouth? Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. They're probably just swallowing. Uh -huh. Um. The what the the krill. Yeah, that was really my question. Yeah. Today. Changing. Uh huh. Well, you have this huge animal up to 40 tons, but its throat is only about the size of a grapefruit. So it can't, it can't eat anything large. It can't, you know, if it got a crab in its mouth, it doesn't have any teeth, it can't crunch it. Oh, you know. Would have to spit right. it out. Right. Yeah. Does it, so it, all they it, need is those little things there that they can lick off the inside yeah. of the baleen. And and krill is pretty small. It, we have we have some uh, we have a little bottle of krill that we show we share with with visitors. And krill is small, very small. Um, krill is very uh, favored by. Uh, humpback, love it, blue, the, you know, the 80 to 100 foot whale subsists on krill. And if you figure if a gray whale is going to have, going to be eating 67 tons of amphipods, you wonder how much is the blue eating. And I don't even want to go there about the ingestion of plastics in the ocean, but that is an issue um, that, that all of the whales who are swimming around uh, deal with. But what also likes krill are salmon. It's what makes salmon pink. Oh. And they're pretty small. So what are the fish that you would uh, recognize as being in the water column that they are going to be able to eat? Uh, 
They might be able to swallow anchovies. Anchovies? What about yeah. sardines? I'm not, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Because they're, they're small, but they're not as small. And the krill are in the water column or on the Yeah, no, the krill are in the water column. Yeah, that's that's what the that's what salmon are eating. Too. Sure. They're not they don't salmon don't go down in the in the benthic. You know, they, they swim along and they find they find a bloom of krill and they have at it. And the same thing with the humpback. When you see humpback feeding, generally you'll see them out on the out in the ocean and they'll be gathered around and they'll be sucking the the um, krill in. Or the anchovy or sardine. Yeah. You can see the krill lines with all the water turtles spread out there. So every now and then you'll see that. Yeah. I'm just curious about cruise ships when you're like sailing. And I mean, you know, out the water and things that they that go back into the water. Oh, well. Uh, from the yeah, ship. I, well, I mean, you know, they are, they are not, they do have rules that they, right. that they live by and um, they have the capacity to uh, wait till they go into, uh, till they dock to, yeah. uh, to clear their, 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 their um, waste. Yeah. Their, Is it true that the krill, because of the warm water and global warming, is coming close to the shore? Yeah. And therefore, the way the whales are seen. Yeah, that's why. Uh, yes, and in fact, that's why we're we've seen this. Uh, situation with the commercial crabbers not being able to begin to crab and well, we, we hope we're waiting for another assessment. Uh, from what I understand from Point Arena and some of the other areas, a lot of the humpbacks have moved on. So we are hopeful that the commercial season will be open at the beginning of December, we shall see. But yes, the reason that we're seeing so many humpbacks so close into shore is because the, the food source has moved in closer. Yeah. Uh, may I ask something yeah. in defense of the fishermen? <laughs> yeah, because um, Bodega Bay is a fishing fisherman, fishing per person friendly place. And um, Dick Ogg is one of our leaders here. He's a wonderful fisherman. He's Captain McCann Jean. And he actually worked with the coastal fishermen to hold off on crabbing, even when the regulations said to go ahead. So the fishermen are conservationists too. Right. They are very hard working on crab traps, all kinds of things. They want their these men here are not our, the enemy of the whale. They're trying to work with the crab. Yeah, I mean the thing is that the, the crab pond has ropes that go down to the bottom, and the and the and the the whales swim and get entangled in the rope, and um, so there's new technology. Uh, that's being investigated. And when you see the rec, uh, rec crabbers out there, they're not using the pots. They're using nets. They're not allowed to use pots. And um, <coughs> the, one other thing I want to mention about I thought where I thought you were going with the uh, cruise ship was uh, there are, you know, there are whale strikes. And so a number of uh, the the fact the num a number of whales are killed by ship strikes every year. So the blue whale, the fin whale, and others. And when the gray whales began to go into San Francisco Bay to feed in the last four years, we they were emaciated. That's why they were going in there. They were looking for food. And and they also, that meant that they were much more vulnerable to ship strikes. So a number of the whale carcasses that, that um, went on to beaches like at Angel Island uh, had been hit by a boat. Wow. So it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of those unfortunate situations, but in the Fairlawn, they uh, they they have instituted a speed limit to slow the ship down to try to avoid 
the ship strikes. So at, when when they come into the uh, with, into the sanctuary boundary, they have to slow down. Use the next slide here. So here's some great pictures of barnacles and light. So the round, white looking, uh, those are barnacles. And then the lights are the kind of pinkish critters around the barnacle. And there uh, is there's one kind of light that, I'm sorry, one kind of barnacle that is only found on the gray whale. And pretty much the barnacles live out their life cycle on, on the gray whale. So when a calf is born in Baja in the lagoon, they, they don't have any, they don't have any barnacles on them. But within about an hour after they're born, the, the uh, barnacle will climb up onto and attach itself into the blubber of the gray whale and live its life cycle out on that gray whale and then fall off, which contributes to the model look. But the, the, uh, the barnacles, are, they feed in the water column. So when the whale dies, the tentacles of the barnacle feed in the whale column as, I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the water column as the whale is diving. And then, as I said, all around the barnacles are lice. And um, there are three kinds of them. And, and by the way, they are amphipods. So they're very similar to what they eat um, family-wise. And two kinds of lice are only on gray whales. And you'll see one of the kind is, there's that scammon word again, named after <coughs> Mr. Scammon. And some of the others, uh, some, one of the others, there, there are many kinds of lice and many kinds of barnacles um, that are found on other whales besides gray whales. What's the, what's the life cycle? How long do they stay on them? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. there, there's a lot of... Uh questions about like high school animals and critters that we get and there's a lot of don't know yeah. about okay. underwater okay. marine life which yeah. is kind of yeah. kind of <laughs> fascinating there's a lot of I so much still to learn about yeah. under yeah. the sea. Oh, okay. I just thought of that kind of pop yeah. my head it's like you know yeah I mean I know that they I live see out, them but it's yeah. like oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I know they live out their life cycle on on the whale that they attach themselves to but how long that life cycle is I don't know Oh, okay. And you know you'll see oh, some sometimes you'll see whales rolling around like at the mouth of the Russian River. They'll be uh, fairly close in to the shore and they'll be rolling around. And you know it appears that they're you know itching, trying to get the barnacles off. But um, yeah, I don't. <laughs> so, so when you know, so when I, I mentioned that when they're up in Depot Bay, you know, they they're eating these porcelain crabs, which are tiny, tiny. There's the mice, there's the the amphipods, there's the the um, the krill. So, but everything that these greys eat are very, very small. And again, as Rich pointed out, they may be fairly large, but they have a very, very small throat opening. So let's see what else. I think I'm at the end of my talk. <laughs> um, well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I've already talked about all of yeah. the yeah. seven. Well, you have the, the number of plates you have to talk about. Um, okay, go back one, sorry. And it's on the other job. Yeah. So yeah, the the what when um Melinda held up the baleen, the uh the baleen is only on its on its upper jaw. They have no baleen on the lower jaw. So and I think I also mentioned that um, what she held up is a fairly small uh base example of baleen because everything that we have at the head 
we have a, a whalebone over there on the table and we have the baleen on the table. Every, all of the ex, uh, exhibits that we have are from a juvenile that washed up on the sewer many, many years ago and they're held under a um, permit by stewards. Uh, but if you can imagine that the, the, the baleen is uh, much longer on uh, an, an adult so, than so, on. So when it says 130, 280 plates, is this, each one of these is a plate. So. On, on the inside. Yeah. On the inside. This, oh, I'm sorry. This yeah, is I, the couldn't, I couldn't see what you were. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyhow. Sorry. So it's quite a few of them. And uh, as it says there, it's made of the same thing our nails are made of. So it's oh. keratin. What's that? Can you guess how many are on that? Is that 20? Pretty good. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Just figuring it out, you know. That's a joke. I guess it's a sense of size. So she's already counted it. It was exactly. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> I'm going to take her to one of those fishbowl things and count, you know, how many marbles are in there. <laughs> so, so, yeah. The inside is what they catch their little their food on, and this is the outer side. And it's more flexible than this when it's alive. Right, right. Yeah. 20, 26, 7, 20 to 18, 9, 90 of them. And, then, and the gray whale has the shortest baleen of any of the bay, of baleen whales. So, I love it, Mark. Right. Bullhead gets up to 18 feet long, hanging from the top of his mouth. Yes, thank you. That's also so you mentioned this whale bone. Might as well show people one of the ones that we show. It's the vertebrae. It's 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 fun thing to have to show people when they're out there, especially the kids. I enjoy sharing these things with the kids and asking if they know where this came from on the whale. And that's the them all, right? Yeah. yeah. Would be nice to kind of relate it to their own vertebrae because kids yeah. might not even know they have it. Yeah, they work. They do, <laughs> around, they, they do get around to that. Oh, okay. It's a little so hard. Bumps that go down the middle of your back. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's kind of relevant. And that's it. Well, the chicken net. Oh, yeah, just like ours. Right. <laughs> and that we used to have a chiropractor that was one of the well watched volunteers, and she'd say, Oh, that's vertebrae number 32. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But, but um, yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of interesting when you know, lift it up and let the kids particularly lift it up and they're pretty blown away by A, how big it is and B, how heavy it is. And to think that, you know, this whale is, has, is full of ribs and good thing that they're in the water and buoyant because because that's a lot of weight to carry around. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a question. It, the gray whale, is their diet uh, just restricted to krill and these shrimp like things? Amphipods. Amphipods. Yeah, predominantly what, what they is eat a, amphipods. What's a krill? A krill is like a shrimp, a shrimp like. Uh, You've heard of the thing plankton? Oh, yes. But this is an amphipod, right? Yeah. yeah but the krill, they, all, they look pretty similar. Yeah. Okay, so they're pretty much the same. They're, so they're, they're like little shrimp? tiny shrimp. I mean, the tiniest, tiniest little shrimp like that that you could. They're like brine shrimp. Yeah. And is their diet just restricted to the amphipods and the no. krill? No. Well, pretty much. Well, what, what the, they also eat the small fish sometimes, right? Like waterfall, yeah. and they'll eat the plankton as waterfall, okay. as well as, as you mentioned, porcelain crab uh -huh. up in Deepo yeah. Bay. Right. So but historically, they, it's been the amphipods, yeah. the amphipods, like and, of their and, diet. and the krill. Yeah. Small small critters in the mud. Mm -hmm. So when they go down to scoop up the the food from the bottom. Mm -hmm. Well, they're getting whatever is there, mm -hmm. and then the things in the water column as they're swimming, as they're opportunistic or whatever, we're going to call that now. Some of them seem to be moving that direction. Right. The pelagic, the pelagic um, catch 
is becoming more critical to them. And, uh, to their and you know, you'll, when they go into the bay, into the San Francisco Bay, and, and it's not only there, I mean, there's some other bays that they go into. <laughs> You you can see the the um the mud plumes that this indicative of that they're trying to feed in the sediment. That, and and uh, now that they're doing a lot of these uh, drone pictures, right. you can see this happening on these you know, videos on online, mm -hmm. where you actually look down. There's the animal feeding, and you could see the mud as it blow or pushes it out. And and, uh, and you can see those little divots in the ground that Norm was talking about when they turn their head into the mud. Yeah. So it, it's incredible what they what we're learning just from watching drone pictures. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So we we have cards available. There's there were some on the table. Uh, Pacific Gray Whale fact cards that we also give out to visitors if they're interested in them that uh, you can pick up from the table that has a sort of a, a short course in facts about the gray whale that you're welcome to take with you. Uh, and we hope that you will come out and join us. And this, this uh, whale here, <laughs> is a great, I took it because it's one of the few that I've ever seen that incorporated baleen into the dock. Most of the other skeletons that you'll see, there's a full skeleton up at McCarricker and some other places along the coast. Uh, you won't see the baleen. So this is pretty cool. It's showing you both the head, the size of the head, the baleen, the jaw bones, the structure, and then you can see some of the ribs, and you can actually see a little bit of the it's the it's uh, it's it's uh, yeah the fin. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, but we, now the yeah, thing but... is that that their their um those those little fingers you can Blinding. see their their fingers yeah, the, the bones yeah. in the paddle in their uh are just like ours. The thing that looks way. like a paddle is actually a yeah. hand and an arm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> From, you know, when they lived on land and then they went back into the ocean. You have that little section of the ball going there. Yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of different resources that you can go to to, to read and learn about the whales and I mentioned already the Laguna San Ignacio Ecosystem Science Program. Um, that started. That was started by Stephen Swartz and uh, Jorge Orban. Stephen Swartz and his wife have been living down in the lagoon since 1977. He has uh, written a book called Lagoon Time, A Guide to Gray Whales and the Natural History of San Ignacio Lagoon. Um, also, there's the uh, Los Angeles American Cetacean Society um, is a great <coughs> whale census and behavior study. The uh, LAACS whale watchers are out at Point Vicente Interpretive Center every day in the daylight hours beginning in early December through late uh, through May, late May. And they've been doing that program since 1979. They've been, so it's a longitudinal population uh, study. And they put out, they're on, they're on Facebook. And every day they put out a report, how many whales they saw, uh, how many calves they saw, where were they, plus other uh, marine mammals that they see as well from that location. It's, it's the Los Angeles American Cetacean Society. Yeah. And then uh, there's an association that with LAACS is the Rio uh, Marine Aquarium. And they have a number of really, they have a lecture series. And they have a lot of really great lectures online. And then the, the official count of how many gray whales are there is done by NOAA the Southwest Fishery Science Center, and they're pretty much at, at Granite Point for the Southwest migration, and then they're 
at Piedras Blancas for the northbound migration count. So they're the ones that say how many whales there are. And, and there, it is an estimate because you can't, there's no way, no matter where you are or what you do uh, or how long you're there because these whales are swimming 24 hours a day. So you can only count them in the daytime and you can only count them when they come up to, to sea. But they are the official federal agency that's responsible for issuing the population figures every year. And um, they're the ones that declare the unusual mortality event being in, being in place or terminated. And, and. but so, so far, this is the fourth year of the uh, unusual mortality event, and it doesn't seem to be uh, dissipated uh, so, at all. I've got a question here. Uh -huh. Do they tag them like they tag land no. animals? No. Oh, no, no. And I was just starting to say about how they survey pinnipeds yesterday, and it's done by aerial survey, so through an airplane. Oh, like you were saying. Oh. And they can, they do it once every five years. They have to fly oh. the whole coast, and it's mm. just a mm. such a snapshot in time with so mm. many variables that it's a really, really rough estimate. Yeah. You know, it just gives you some basic information. So it is, it's hard to track the. Yeah. The population. Yeah, that's like, you know, when when they, when we say now that the population has declined by 20% and we feel that the current, they feel the current population is 20,000, well, that's based on the best scientific, you know, it's scientific, it's not just like, you know, you know, put your finger on your tongue and hold it up to the air. It, it is scientific, but again, they can only see what they can see in daylight hours so basically when the whale is present. When the whale's present. Yeah. Oh, one of the things Norma mentioned is that the whales are swimming constantly, 24 hours a day. That's important for two reasons. Uh, one, it, it's understanding they, they have the ability to shut down half their brain and rest it while they are able to continue along sort of using half a brain. Yeah. It's, like, it's called yeah. un unihemispheric. They're unihemispheric. Yeah. And in addition to these whales, there are the, the birds that are circumpolar, they, they're unihemispheric also. Right. So that they can continue to swim. I'm sorry, so, so that, well, they swim. They continue <laughs> to swim. They can breathe. They can dive. Uh, while they're while they're half of the half of their brain is resting, and the same with the birds, they continue to fly while they half the brain is resting. Yeah, you know, the, the other reason reason that's important is because quite often people will come and ask us, well, what's the best time to come out and see the whales, as if they're on a schedule or something. <laughs> and you know, we just you know, like there are as many going by at noon time as there are at midnight. I mean, it's just it's the same. The only thing that really changes are the conditions. And we have changed the hours of the whale watch to start a little earlier now. We're starting at 10 a.m. in the morning and we're, we're closing down at two in the afternoon. And that's primarily because of conditions. The mornings are typically calmer, nicer. The afternoon, Starting around two o'clock or a little later, we really start getting a lot of wind out on the head and it becomes very uncomfortable. So uh, it makes no difference to the whales. As I say, they're pretty much going 24 hours a day, but uh, it does make a, or a difference to us. Could you mention the point arena folks? And yeah, how you can yeah. Touch so with them? so there's, there's, there's point rays, you know, that's a great place to see grays. There's us. There's Point Arena Lighthouse, and that uh, Facebook is Mendonoma Whale and Seal Study. That's uh, Scott and Tree Mercer. They're out there every day, <laughs> pretty much. Then could there's you, the, Could you repeat the name of the site? Mendonoma Whale and Seal Study. Mendo. Yeah, Mendocino and Sonoma and, County. And it's a blend okay. of Mend <laughs> Mendonoma. <laughs> and then there's the Depot Bay, Oregon, uh, the location where Carrie Newell has the summer resident grays. 
There's Cascadia Research Collective, John Kalamokidis, Kalambokidis, I'm sorry. I, I always have trouble with his name. So wonderful. Um, he talks about the Pacific Coast Feeding Group and the Sounders. And then there's the Center for Whale Research with, with Ken Belcom. He's in the San Juan Islands. And they do research on the, the orca. And I didn't go too much into the orca because I know we're running out of time here. But um, the orca is is, their, <coughs> is the gray whale's only predator, mostly on the calves and mostly in places like Marie, uh, Monterey Bay. And when they have to go through the Unimac Pass in Alaska, where it's very narrow, the orca will lie in wait and then go after the calves. And um, they are teaching their, their calves to feed. So that's it. I'm going to stop now. Yeah. Um, we can wait afterwards. You can ask me questions. We'll be out of the head. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted, just wanted to say how wonderful it is to be a whale watch I'm going to tell you what whale watch is really like. <laughs> An entire season I went through, I think I saw four whales. I do Saturdays, so I do the shift out there. Well, it doesn't come out on Sunday, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> There's no whales on Sunday. They do, but right. you're going to hear everything out there. I had a guy walk up, I told this to my next story to my neighbor. I had a guy walk up and said, What are you going to do? I jump off the cliff. We don't get in the way of. Natural selection. <laughs> okay. Um, the kids. We can talk about amphipods with the kids, but it's better when you tell them that the whales put mud in their mouth and get the bugs out. The kids listen to you. Hardest thing to do is to get a kid to see the whale go by. Now, if you get a whale, and let's say they're going. Southbounders are going to, you might see some southbounders today when we go out there because the mothers are on, they're moving. But when they're coming back close, it's hard to get kids to see the whales because they're not going to look very long because there's other things going on. You got pelicans that serve the waves. You got the uh, harbor seals that sleep on the rocks at the low tide. People would come up and say, You see more whales at high tide? <laughs> 24 hours a day. Sometimes they're sleeping left side, right side. They cruise up and down, right? The, the issue for me is if they have an accent. Well, when I, I, first thing I want to know is where you're from. Okay? Because, and the whole time we're watching the water, right? But you're talking with an accent. I want to know where you're from. I want to know where you're from in the world. And you guys are going to meet, if you're out there with us, everywhere. They come from everywhere. And my next question to them is, why are you here? <laughs> Brother-in-law told me to come here. It's on the hotel brochure. You don't know how people find their way to the head. Right? You know, I'm, we're re yeah, I'm reading a Hitchcock. or watching Hitchcock movies. So we had to come out. You'll hear, I'm on a beer tour. <laughs> so we stop by up here. You get you get all sorts of and so what time did the whales get here? <laughs> all the time. You're gonna hear the questions over and over again. So your little blue slip with all the little information, that's your information, right? And they're gonna ask these questions. You're gonna hear it all day long. <laughs> Same question. They're gonna sneak up behind you while you're sitting there looking out, and they're gonna say, See any whales today? <laughs> they're going to ask you that all day long somebody's going to come up and then sometimes you're going to say we haven't seen a whale in three weeks and then you're going to have to be apologetic for not having any whales out there right and then you go through well they do this the mothers are doing this and everybody's going like this if you get a whale coming north that'll be later in the season you've got about 20 minutes once you once you spot it and then you get everybody looking. And you can see when they move on the head, the, the people on the head follow the way.
right? They'll move from one side of the head to the other. So while they're looking, you as a whale watch are looking for the next whale trying to come up. Okay? And yeah, it, it, it gets really ridiculous out there. Now, you like being in an airport? This is like being in an airport. You're going to see people from the valley come out with flip flops on, shorts, no shirt, and it's going to be 40 degrees and blowing 25 miles an hour. Right? They get out of their cars when they're doing that. They stay there five minutes and they're gone. If there's no whales coming by, they're there, they're gone. So, what you have to get used to if you, when you're doing whale watch is being able to impart what we know, what's on our little card here, what's going on. Sorry, we wish we could show you the whales, but they're not here right now, but watch the pelicans surf the wave, right? And when the pelicans are here, the little uh, oyster catchers, yeah. the oyster catchers that are so loud out there and you're going, what the heck is that? Canadian geese that are nesting, where Canadian geese are not supposed to be nesting on the cliffs. We have uh, falcons that uh, nest in the cliffs over there. So while there are no whales, there's lots of other things going on. I've got bobcat, uh, coyote, you name it, they're all out at the head. So this is one of the things that you deal with with all these people is, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> there's just so much to see. <laughs> right, it's, so you're not, you're going to have to, it's not just whales, whales, whales. They're not going to be doing it. We had an opening day where we had 40 sightings and 20 breaches once wow. in January. I have not had a day like that since. But some days they're all there and some days they're not there. And you can't, you, I don't want you guys to go out there with the expectation it's going to be whale, 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 whale. <laughs> because it's not it's going to be, there's one, and then you wait an hour, and here comes another one. But you get to stand out there, look at Point Reyes, look up the coast towards the Davis Lab. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a yes. wonderful four hours. And what, the biggest part for me is where these people are coming from and why are they here. Okay, so there's a lot more than just, you got all this information, on all the whales and what they're doing and everything else. But when you're on the head, you're going to be dealing with people on a one-to-one -one basis. And they're going to be able, they're going to talk to you about everything. It's not going to be about whales. They're going to tell you about your trip to Maui. We saw whales in Maui, right? You're going to hear that all day long. These people coming in because they're going to tell you their stories. And sometimes they'll sit with you for half an hour just talking to you. So there's a lot, you're almost an ambassador out there. So yeah, the whales are going by. No, there's no way, but where are you from? Oh, I noticed your accent. So I'm almost rude when that happens. <laughs> All right. So the reality of whale watch, you bring clothes for Hawaii and you pack for the Himalayas. <laughs> it's the only way. We call it blow data. Two o'clock. That's what we're talking, what Rich was talking about. The wind comes up. Normally the wind comes up at two o'clock. It's really nice in the morning, and then it gets wild, okay? So that's your dose of reality. Yeah, there are some days where the, the coordinator will decide that there's just really no reason to stay until 2 o'clock. And it's right. principally because of the conditions. We may have whales going by, but if we don't have any people standing out on the head, we don't have any people to talk to, to inform, to give information to. We don't really have a job. And so if we look around and there's just nobody in the parking lot and nobody coming out onto the head, uh, we just may call it quits for the day. Let you all go and we'll watch the rest of them come by. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a, we've got two more really important uh, things to talk to you about, but. We're, we're going to reconvene at the head uh, after lunch, and we're happy to talk some more about what it's like out there. I'm sorry I'm going to cut you off, Richard. I, I wanted to ask you, but you, you've you imparted what? some stuff. What? So. <laughs> so. <laughs> I heard my name. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, now.
are we going to talk about the program logistics shifts? Uh, or tips or... Well, I think um, yeah, just really really quick. You want to tell people uh, calling so how to dress and. Excuse me, we can't hear her at all. Sorry. Thank you. Can you just start it? Wait, when the weather seems like wherever you are, it seems okay and may as well go out. Uh, sometimes on the head itself, it can be just really blowing us to pieces or whatever, rain, whatever. Anyway, the idea being, uh, don't try to judge the weather by where you are. The uh, coordinator should contact you in time so that you don't leave home uh, to come on out if, if it's, it's going to be canceled. Yeah. So sometimes we have to cancel the whole day. Uh, yes. Everybody might already know this, but the day that they have a webcam available 24 days, 24 hours a day, trying to show you what the conditions are right now. Boom. 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 Yeah, I should do that. The other thing I wanted to not forget is uh, I really urge you to have polarized lenses on your sunglasses. And that's because the glare can really make it very difficult to see. And often if I'm seeing a spout and, I, and the person next to me says, I don't see it, I don't see it. And I turn and look at them, they don't have on, on usually any glasses and particularly not a polarized lens so that they can't make uh, the distinction, the contrast. Here's our vest that we wear over our coat because we have to layer, layer, layer. That's really important. Make sure you have something for your head, your ears, your, you know, around your neck, whatever, because when the wind comes up, we do stay up for quite a bit, and, and it can get awfully cold. Um, but we do wear the whale watch um, vest so that people can uh, figure out who we are and what's going on and come up and say, have you seen any whales today? <laughs> <laughs> or what time will they be here? <laughs> for, yeah, for it is. And the, the other thing is, those of you who are brand new, you may be sitting here right now going, I'll never know all that stuff. You know, how am I going to learn all that? Um, we give you lots and lots of time and we encourage you to stand next to somebody who's what we consider a veteran, somebody who's been around for a while. They can give you some tips or just watching them, just kind of shadowing somebody. Mm -hmm. That works really well. So um, please don't get concerned that there's so much information is more than you can do. Don't be afraid to say you don't know and then go find yeah. somebody That's who does. That's right. And, and if Norma's out there, you can say, <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. Yeah. Well, in addition to everything from flip flops to snow boots, do we also bring uh, a launch here, binoculars? Oh, not fine. Okay. But, yeah, we do have some people who like uh, a need to sit down, um, but it really makes it a little difficult when you're trying to talk with someone and make them feel, you know, a part of what's going on. So we, we would like you to stand as long as you can. And also um, uh, kind of yeah, mix it up a little bit. So we have people standing on the head. We have people down at the table kind of greeting the people. And we've got a, uh, that's where we have our artifacts. So, you know, kind of mix it up a little. Yeah. Do you have the artifacts every day? Every, every day you're out? We almost always, because <laughs> the, the difference would be if it's a really windy day, um, they sure. they start moving around and that we are very limited about what we can take out. 
Um, we store them out there in the, in in one of the buildings there. That's we're we're going to go through all that when we go. Yeah. Out one okay. Yeah. So we have access to it though. We can bring them out or or not whenever we want. Okay. And binoculars. 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 Bring your binoculars. Except that you know what? And for the most part, when you see a whale, see a blow, um, that's the time to pull them up. But to just scan, you have a very limited um, view, field. so field of vision. So yeah. that's not so good. The eyes work really well. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Much better than the yeah. yeah. Really. What about scheduling? Now you said that some of We're going to talk about them. And um, oh, the other one more thing that I thought of. You know, we were talking about the different locations. Um, the bodega head is um, preferred in some ways because of access, because there are a lot of people who don't, you know, have mobility or whatever else, or they just don't want to get out of their car. And so they can just drive up there and stay in their car if they want or get out. And we do allow dogs on the head, not on the trails, but on the head. So, uh, you know, if they've been traveling with their dog, they're glad to get them out of the car for a little bit. <laughs> but we're, we are not enforcers. We're not out yeah. there to prevent or to stop people from doing anything. You know, if they ask if they can take the dog on the hit, on the trail, we tell them no, that's not allowed. And we try to explain to them why. If, if they don't ask, but they just take the dog up there, it's not our job to go chase them down and uh, and make them take the dog back to the car. So. Hey, I am not stand trap, but I have a few actually living dogs in the park when I'm roving. Mm -hmm. I hold security so that I can put the kids. We have them. We throw floor and the table. Yeah. yeah. Where can I take my dog? Yeah, we give them to them whenever they come up and ask what they can do. Yeah, they appreciate it. But that's just one thing. I mean, sometimes okay. you, you get people up there that want to get out and they get, want to get too close to the head. They want to climb down on the rocks on the other side of the head. It's very dangerous. The, the, the uh, decomposed granite is very slippery. And you see little kids and stuff going out there. Again, you know, our, our, our job is to caution them. Our job is to try and make sure they're aware of the danger and everything. But our job is not to prevent or stop them from doing it. Yeah, we need to move on. We have okay. to let this get to the head. We're going we're to we're do uh, two more pieces. Uh, the first one, Alice is going to share about our volunteer paperwork yeah. and uh, the better impact system. Paperwork is uh, really important um, as it relates to partnership with California State Parks, also ensuring liability coverage, uh, ensuring consistency and, and standardization, and then better impacts is where we register time. And then the second part is I'm going to talk very quickly about schedule. Okay, so that's the most exciting part. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I know most of you guys already being volunteers, which is more than post interrupted. So if you are new volunteers or interested volunteers, if you want to become a official volunteer for the California State Parks, you will need to submit a paperwork. So if you can go to our website, it's called stewardscr.org. So it's the initial of the stewards of the Coast of Rebels. So stewards Coast of uh, CR.org. Then, uh, if you go to the home page stop. on the wait, top, wait, stop. you need to face us and talk. You oh, okay. You are yeah. very soft, and I yeah, you have Okay, get it. Yeah, I just talked with Mike. <laughs> so, if you go to our webpage and uh, on the top, there's a volunteer tab. Just click the volunteer and then click the volunteer opportunities. Then you scroll down, you know, here is a new volunteer onboarding packet. Just click it. Yeah, the Wi-Fi is a little bit slow here. And then 
this is a one-stop paperwork and you can uh, download and uh, fit them out. And uh, there is a checklist. So a list of things like you can sign up our newsletter to learn our new programs. And uh, you can also contact stewards to talk about your interests. And then there is a California State Parks volunteer application, just this form. And if you download and uh, then you can fill this uh, PDF. And we'll send this out to everyone. Um, hopefully everyone registered online for the training. And yeah. if not, you can share your email address with Alex and we'll make sure that's send it out to you. What do folks do if they don't have a printer? Email. Yes, you can yeah. fill it digitally. Yeah. Yeah. It's a PDF form. It's a, yeah. it's a PDF, and you, you know you just have to type your name in once, and it fills it in everywhere. Um, just like uh, this one, I just downloaded. So there's a PDF reader, so I can you know check all of the things, and then I can enter my first name here, and then last name, so I can do it. Then you can email us your paperwork. Okay, yeah, you can email it to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because my printer doesn't work either. Yeah. Yeah, you can try several PDF readers. You know, the Adobe is not working on my computer right now, so I use another PDF reader. Yeah. And then yeah. uh... and we're, we're happy to <laughs> we're happy to help too with um, the paperwork. If anybody has questions, reach out to them to yeah. just the work through it. <laughs> so we could just call it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, do I have to fill this up again? No. No, you are done. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> did, you, did you say you have to be signed up? I didn't sign up. What is that? For today? Yeah. yeah. Just leave your email with yeah. Alex and we'll put you on the list for. We're going to send up a follow up email that has this information as well as how to sign up um, and then some of the links that Norma talked about today. Yeah, if you want to learn more info about the Whale Watch, just go to our you know web page. There is a volunteer volunteer opportunities. You know, then scroll down. There is the Sonoma Coast a State Park. Yeah. Scroll down, down, down. There is the Sonoma Coast volunteer opportunities. Click it. Screw down, there is a will watch. So this web page is only for will watch volunteers. And you can see here's a new volunteer onboarding package. Another thing is about the duty statement of the will watch doses. <laughs> it's the same, just click it and uh, sign this duty statement. And uh, you can email us or send us our know, copy. So these are two paperwork. And another thing is uh, once you submit the paperwork and you need to sign up on the Better Impact, that's a software, you know, created by the state parks. They use that software to, uh, you know, check volunteers' hours so you can record how many hours you work. And uh, okay. we're meeting at the head at one o'clock. So that's when we'll get started. There's a way for there. There's a question. So to track our hours, yeah. Um, to go <coughs> look at the state park passes. Yeah, here, here is the info. So if you got 24 hours, and you will get a, a park pass for Sonoma Mendocino District Parks. If you work 200 hours, then you will get a uh, park pass for most of the. California State Parks. Yeah. They said by the end of the year, what are you going to fiscal year? Yeah. 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 December. Yeah. December. Yeah. Okay. So it's not this calendar year. Calendar year is our fiscal year. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the state is due. Okay. Yeah, we will follow up all of the links and resources. Help you finish the paperwork, sign up on the Better Impact the website. Yeah. And do we need a badge if we're going to be volunteering? Yeah. Get a badge. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah. Oh, this thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the same quality. Like, so, you, you you know, know, I don't but, have one, so I'll get one at the end of the year. No, you can imagine that one. Yeah. 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 You, can, right uh, you should have yeah. one. Yeah, let's see if I take one for you. Yeah. Okay. That's going to do you anything else? Uh, I think I'm all set. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to uh, share with folks the, uh, you know, when, when are we out there? How do you sign up? Uh, so on our Whale Watch page on our website, we'll also send out a link to this. Um, we have the Whale Watch schedule. So it's a team up calendar. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, it's really easy to use. You just go to the date. Um, Click on when you'd like to sign up and hit sign up. Are and we going to start the uh, New Year's weekend? We are New Year's weekend. Yeah, we should start the New Year's weekend. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, up to, it's up to Norma. Bye, bye, bye. You can we'll be a bit recording. And, and so we're going to list the coordinators with their phone numbers for each weekend. And then we'll have folks signed up with their email addresses yeah. so that people can get in touch in the case of uh, inclement weather um, or to just reach out and say, oh, hi, I'd like to chat on this day. Um, this is what we use for signing up. You don't need to sign in or anything. You can just click on a date and click sign up and put your name in and you're ready to go. Any? I am not clear. So we're right. we're shadowing someone. We'll notice that someone's already signed up for that day, and then we can write in that we want to shadow yeah, that person. You, you'd probably write to the coordinator for that. Hey, you pick okay. the day you want to come out yeah. and do it, and somebody will be there. Yeah. And the coordinator that's there will take care of everything for you. Yeah. Trust us. Yeah. But it's but also, please stand up. No. All right. So we so just come on a little bit, right? Yeah. Well, it's all only weekend. We'll get, we'll get together with you guys. Seven, 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 seven. We need to get together and decide what we kind of want to do for this. So it's it's, uh, it's twelve oh six. Any questions um, online? Otherwise, we're gonna wrap up and reconvene at the head at one p.m. We're gonna do a screen from the head. Yeah. No. <laughs> Is there gonna be online? Thank you, guys. Oh. Is there gonna be cameras for online? Say that again, Karen. You can use your email. Is there going to be a camera uh, available for online folks? Oh, no, we don't have to share it. Oh, no, I'm